Up next, we've got a, a great friend, uh, Yelena Durek, Operations Manager at Informal Systems. And she will be speaking about the new world struggles to be born, coordinating in a time of crisis. So let me add Yelena to the stage. One moment, please. Yelena, you should be able to add your camera and mic. Hi. Hey, Yelena. Hey, Aiden. Fancy seeing you here. Yeah. It's almost like we were just walking in the park just a few days ago. Yeah, it's almost <laughs> as if. How that awesome. works now. Let me give you the stage. Thank you for your patience throughout this, and we'll talk soon. Awesome. Thanks, Aiden. Okay, um, so I have my presentation. Uh, I guess it's showing the browser, but that's fine. We'll just keep it as is. Um, okay, well, thank you so much. Um, thanks to the team for putting this on. Uh, you know, I've been a friend of the team since I think before, you know, Chainsafe was officially inc incorporated as a company. Uh, you know, it's amazing to see all the progress and, uh, you know, congratulations to the whole team uh, on everything that you guys have done. I mean, I'm kind of like a chain safe uh, evangelist <laughs> these days. So, or not even these days for quite a while. So um, yeah, congrats on the conference and uh, for all the progress uh, to date. Um, so for my presentation, we're gonna switch gears a bit. Um, there's been some incredible, uh, uh, very technical, a lot of interesting updates. Uh, obviously we just heard one from Polkadot on parachains, um, you know, very interesting developments being made. Um, but me, uh, as more of an operations person, uh, obviously, you know, not, not, not uh, highly technical, um, I wanted to talk about something else, uh, something a little bit more high level and something maybe we can say more in the realm of human systems uh, versus technical systems. Um, so that's kind of setting the stage uh, for what I'll be talking about. Um, and really, over the course of my studies and career, I've really been fascinated by uh, systemic change, you know, from how it happens to what happens after and really everything in between. Um, in university, I actually focused on post-conflict societies specifically, so really those ravaged by war, um, but I was also fascinated by history and you know the lead up to these kind of cataclysmic events. So really political history, political economics, uh, and, and uh, definitely touches of political philosophy here and there. Um, and really looking at human events from a systems lens is partially what drew me to Bitcoin. Uh, you know, technology which I'm sure many people here uh, you know, know very well, but a technology which was designed to work outside the global financial system, uh, you know, a system that you know, has really been a force for evil for many people around the world. And you know, today I won't be talking about my uh, you know, falling in love story with Bitcoin, maybe that's for another time, uh, but, and I'm sure many people here can relate to that, to that kind of love story, um, but we'll talk, be talking about the nature of transitions, uh, the nature of transitions between systems you know, human systems, political systems, and, uh, you know, what we, uh, as builders of a new system, both technical and human, can take away from these lessons. Um, and again, I think many of these lessons are grounded in political history and political economics, uh, but, um, you know, hopefully we can actually have kind of very specific tactical takeaways as well. Um, so where to begin? Um, in my own life, I usually begin with philosophy, and I thought, uh, I would pepper that into this presentation. Um, and we're going to look to Antonio Gramsci, so very well-known uh, kind of 20th century uh, political philosopher. And the title of my talk, you know, is The Old World is Dying Away. And it actually comes from this quote here by Antonio Gramsci. And he said, the crisis consists precisely in the fact that the old is dying and the new cannot be born. In this intergenum, a great variety of morbid systems appear. Um, so Antony Gramsci actually was a prisoner of Mussolini's uh, fascist Italy. He would later die in that prison, and this is actually a quote in one of his prison notebooks. Um, but really, what did Gramsci mean by, you know, this kind of interim period, uh, the kind of the new world unable to be born and the old world really kind of dying away? Um, well, he talked a lot about morbid symptoms. You know, those symptoms are morbid because they show that the existing order suffers from existential problems, and really they're unlikely to be solved in the current framework, or perhaps the old framework. Um, at the same time, a new stable kind of hegemonic order doesn't seem to be on the rise, and nothing is really there to supplant the old one. Um, obviously, you know, 
Antonio being in kind of a, you know, a fascist prison, he, he very much was living this life of being in the interim, you know, uh, seeing fascism kind of take hold in Europe. And really, he saw this crisis period and he saw that the period itself, the crisis period, this transition period was in fact shaped by these morbidities, you know, the ones that cannot be managed um, at all in the moment, but at the same time do not represent a viable alternative for the future. Um, we'll come back to this idea of morbid symptoms and how to address them in our own current system. Obviously, it's not 1930s fascist Italy, but we do very much live in a world uh, where the current system is, uh, you know, fundamentally unsound. Um, so how did Gramsci approach these, uh, you know, the studies of uh, symptoms systematically? Well, he really understood crises not as events, but as processes. And first, you know, the crises are not framed as external shocks. They are not random. They're not something external that just breaks the social order spontaneously. Um, crises themselves have a history and they originate in this history of tensions, contradictions, and really this dying social order. Um, Gramsci obviously, you know, do a major critique of capitalism itself, but the main lesson to be taken away is kind of looking at these points of transition as um, you know, kind of historical phenomena, right? They're not random. We are in a transitionary period, but how did we get there? Kind of let's interrogate that. So if crises, you know, are not reducible to single external events, um, you know, they, they are more than just kind of going from point A to point, point B. They're kind of long, these moments of transition can be complicated, uh, multidimensional, transformative. Uh, they're very complicated uh, kind of points in history to examine. And really my argument is that we live in one such transition. Uh, and again, kind of going back to this idea of us being builders, we need to really kind of, kind of work really hard to understand this complex nature of this kind of transition period. Um, so yeah, we should look at the present crisis as a distinct phase of instability and uncertainty. It's not a easy transition between two stable periods. And really we should be zooming, zooming in on the particularities and kind of idiosyncrasies of the crisis of the current system. Um, so, you know, it seems to me that in our community, we kind of lack um, an, an analytical framework or even just like a focus uh, of resources to kind of study the nature of the crisis as it unfolds. Um, I believe we should be actively developing this body of thought on how to transition and how this transition will unfold and where this technology might play a role. Um, indeed, if this technology is a, an engine for coordination. Um, and so today I'm here to talk about the ways we can analyze the nature of the crisis itself. Um, and again, we must get into the habit of systematically analyzing the nature of transitions between systems. And with that knowledge, hopefully um, kind of build for a more just world. Okay, so getting into it. Uh, this guy, I think, is pretty famous. Uh, so this is a really kind of well-known, uh, you know, adage, you know, um, epithet. Those who tell the stories rule society. Um, and, you know, this is a platonic philosophy. And for me, it's really important to examine the dominant stories being told. Why does this matter? Well, the stories that we tell ourselves can be misleading, and we really kind of need to understand the truth behind the stories we tell. And I think interrogating these stories will help us to figure out how we can have hopefully a just transition to the new world. Um, so just some fun stories we've told ourselves uh, throughout history. Um, I don't know who is familiar with this model uh, of the universe. This is the geocentric model, uh, you know, where it was uh, thought that the, the moon, the sun, the stars all revolved around the earth. They traveled in perfect circles. The earth was stationary and we were at the center of the uni universe. Um, you know, even when we would actually observe planets, you know, and kind of taking irregular non-circular paths, uh, we would just develop theories and models and complicated kind of ways to rationalize just the basic incorrect assumption. So you would get things like this, um, kind of very complicated, funny, diagram. And, you know, the story really isn't about scientific progress. It's not really about like a genuine exploration of our place in the cosmos. It's a really a story about self-preservation. You know, we want to be in the story. We want to be in the center of the world. You know, we want to preserve the rule of the Catholic Church. We want to kind of have, um, you know, we just want to preserve our kind of, let's say, identities or our systems. And obviously, we would know later on that this was incorrect. And this was very uh, you know, bad premise, but 
we told the story for centuries and centuries and we justified the, um, you know, the story even with, you know, observations. Okay. So to me, um, you know, the story of this like geocentric model of the universe is actually kind of similar to what we see in our current world in how we approach the stock market and how you approach the global financial system and how we approach all this kind of crazy unsustainable hyper growth um, stuff. And really it's also about self-preservation, you know? Um, this is showing, you know, uh, this is showing the stock market, you know, there's high frequency trading algor algorithms making 10,000 trades every second. Uh, nobody can understand it. It's very complex. Obviously, it's a different type of complexity than the geocentric model of the universe, but it tells the same story. The need for self-preservation to keep the status quo even when it's obviously unsustainable and built on flawed assumptions. So, you know, it's important that we understand how stories get told, how they get propagated, and the kind of effects they have for the systems we build. Um, you know, stories are not spontaneous. They are not some external shock to the system. They arise, again, kind of taking Gram Gramscian thought. They arise out of a history of tensions, contradictions from the old system. And really, when we talk about storytelling in our community, you know, we need to kind of constantly bring this up. Who are we talking to? What needs are we addressing? How do you build a movement through storytelling, but not just telling any old story, telling good stories, just stories, equitable stories? Do we have a common language, commonly understood definitions? You know, where are the gaps in understanding? These are things that we should be constantly interrogating if we hope to transition to a better world. Okay, this is a funny slide. So I think people here are, most people are probably, um, you know, uh, familiar with, uh, you know, DeFi and, the memes and the the hype and all of this fun stuff. Um, but really, what are sorts of needs are these narratives addressing? You know, what are we saying when we just talk about, you know, making money out of thin air and playing with virtual money? Like, what is it that we are assuming about our kind of common uh, kind of needs? Um, so, you know, we're not really going to dive into it right now. But um, it's just an example of kind of needing to interrogate these stories, these structures, and what they're fundamentally um, assuming about who we are as a, as, a, as a humanity. Okay, so that's kind of the first part of my talk on ways we can analyze the kind of transitionary point. And we're going to kind of step back and look at it from a different perspective, um, so different from storytelling. And this is actually a little bit more tactical and a little bit more on the ground. Um, you know, so a little bit more looking on the ground, how we coordinate transitions and lessons that can be drawn specifically from political history and political economics. So what do you really need to address uh, when you want to coordinate a transition? Well, we need to kind of think about how we build a new system by addressing the fatal flaws from the previous system and focusing on needs, right? I think um, kind of it's fairly obvious to kind of many like academics and researchers and thinkers within like the fields of studies I just mentioned that planning for future progress, one in which we don't know what it will look like, is probably a bad bet, right? I think it's really important to consider the previous systems, how it was designed, what the fatal flaws were, and how we address those fatal flaws in this interim so that we can again, hopefully plan for a more just world. Um, so I'm actually going to talk a little bit about my own experience. Um, so in my own life, um, you know, a couple, maybe a few people on this call will know this, who know me well, but I've sought out to be, um, you know, on the ground in the first person to see what it looks like when systems are in flux and when they change. So I'm gonna give two examples from just my own experience and my own research and what that looks like. And, um, you know, these are never like copy and paste solutions. I think when we as builders of like a new system or trying to manage the transition from the old to the new, we're going to have to find other examples and ways we can engage uh, on the ground. But these are just two examples to kind of, um, you know, give, give something more tangible. Um, so this example here, this is actually about the Georgian microfinance industry. Um, so this is a bit of a stock photo. I couldn't find any pictures for my trip there, but, um, we we'll talked about it. So uh, quite a few years ago, I traveled to Tbilisi for a field research trip where I was looking at, you know, microfinance as an indicator for how successful or unsuccessful 
um, Georgia, the country, had transitioned from communism to capitalism, from centrally planned economy of mass production to a flexible production system, you know, that would leverage things like fair trade, free fair trade, uh, and you know, just the, ca the capitalist kind of system. You know, I knew I wanted to keep studying political econo economies that had undergone rapid transition. And for me, Georgia is just a very interesting use, ca uh, use case. Um, microfinance institutions are, were, you know, were very ripe for exploration. The industry had cropped up as a financial way of helping average Georgians become more entrepreneurial and take on a sort of capitalist mindset. Um, in this photo, these are actually um, uh, these are actually beneficiaries of this kind of new microfinance industry after the fall of the communism in the Soviet Union. And really what I saw like on my in my field research was, you know, there were a lot of different systems at play, everyone from the European Union to the United States to even international economic organizations like the IMF. But the needs were on the ground and the impact was felt on the ground. And really, you know, um, the lesson I took away was I could have spent months or weeks in Brussels or Washington talking to policymakers, but ultimately to get a sense of the needs and kind of the human level uh, impact that these systems of transition had and how you can help people that were in fact on the front lines, it rested with farmers, laborers, the people that would ultimately benefit or be disadvantaged from these new systems like the microfinance industry. Um, so this is another example um, of a moment of transition. So uh, this was something very dear to my heart um, where I studied again, went on the ground, had a grant from the you know, University of Toronto and spent a lot of uh, weeks, months preparing and actually going there. Um, so what happened here? Um, this was the refugee crisis in the Balkans in 2015. Um, so obviously there was you know a massive refugee crisis. It was global. Um, you know this is another example of pressure being put on a system and visibly collapsing from that pressure. Um, you know the system being the European Union's inability to provide immediate need and humanitarian assistance and to get consensus from states on how to facilitate needs and protection. Um, and, you know, to understand the conflict, again, it was about going to where the needs were most visible and where you could actually uh, analyze and most visibly see the transition happening from one system to another. And this place ended up being um, the, the Balkan region, kind of in between the East and the West, the East being the Middle East and the West being uh, kind of Western Europe. And Again, this, the crisis was just another example of how systems react to crisis and whether or not they can adapt or they can't. And obviously, in, in this case, obviously, after like a lot of research, you know, it was obvious that these systems couldn't. Uh, it really severely calls into question dominant institutions and their ability to actually do what they're supposed to do. Um, but again, it was just looking, finding those places of transition from one system to the next, this interim period where usually chaos happens and bad things happen but really analyzing you know, how we can make sure that the new system hopefully will actually be responsive to human needs in a just way. Okay, so those are two, uh, two examples from my uh, personal kind of research and experience. Um, and okay, so I'm sure a lot of people on the call, well, what does this have to do with blockchains? What does this have to do with technology? Uh, or what does this have to do with what, what we're here doing kind of on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, fundamentally, in the most basic, simple terms, if blockchains are going to be engines for coordination, they should also concern human systems. Um, you know, in many ways, um, blockchain systems are obviously innovations within distributed computing, cryptography, many areas of computer science, but they are also should be considered the innovations within human organizations, you know, and again, this is a subset of many fields, including uh, political economies, uh, sociology, things like this. So ultimately, we should be analyzing the impact of these systems, the ones, uh, how they have it from a human lens, and not just as a technical phenomena that is a human tool, but a human system unto itself. Um, so, you know, in which transition of system do we find ourselves in right now? I think, um, you know, for me, uh, it's not something I'm prepared to make a declarative statement on, but Ultimately, what I think is happening is the previous system, which we know to be defined as hyper growth, disrupt at all costs, you know, this kind of, uh, you know, Silicon Valley model of like disrupt, disrupt, disrupt without having a concern for human needs. Obviously, that is probably failing and disastrous and like not going to be the status quo for like ever and for even for much longer. 
So there will be new systems around sustainability, you know, um, less need for hyper growth, maybe localism, not sure what that looks like, but whatever that new system that we want to kind of um, develop and be a part of in creating, um, we should consider the transitionary period and how we get there. Um, so ultimately, question to ask in times of transitions, um, what, what, what are the inherent problems from the previous system? How do those symptoms manifest? So again, we're talking about symptoms. Gramsci would talk a lot about morbid systems. Um, this is something we should also be uh, cr critiquing constantly. And how does our community address those gaps and incrementally build uh, for a new world? Um, I think I'm actually gonna stop it there. I don't actually know how long it's been, but um, we're gonna, yeah, I think it's probably been like 20, 25 minutes, so. You're good. If you wanna continue, it's up to you. Yeah, how long has it been, you know? It's only been 20 minutes. Oh, perfect, and okay. We, we got some questions too, so please take your time. You know no what, why don't, yeah, okay, thanks Aiden. Why don't we actually do some questions and answers? I think I kind of do wanna stop there. Go I on. had some other Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Um, awesome. So we have three questions for you. So the first one is, how can we get developers and engineers to have a human lens and ensure they are considering the human side of things when they are developing these blockchain networks? That's a great question. Um, so I think the biggest kind of piece of advice I would give um, is hire people to consider these questions. And depending on like how your, what your business is and how you kind of stay afloat um, and make money, that will obviously be a part of that equation. But I think making sure that there is somebody at least keeping a pulse and making sure that there is a grander perspective beyond you know, the, the, the typical kind of uh, engineering development process that can just, especially if you're product focused, I think that's kind of the main thing. Um, we, we so quickly are, quick to push out things into market into people's hands, not realizing what ha needs to happen in between something being developed in house to like, you know, an app on your phone or some sort of um, thing that people use. So I had informal systems, I will give a plug. Uh, we were intentionally structurally designed. We are intentionally structured as a cooperative. So we're constantly considering how do we evolve a cooperative structure internally, hopefully one day export that to other companies that are doing similar work. Um, and I think that just already that simple need premise takes you outside of your kind of immediate day-to-day uh, -day reality. For sure. Thank you for that answer. And before we move on to the next questions, I just I didn't because kind of we just ran into the questions. Thank you for that awesome presentation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because, you know, at the end of the day, um, we really do need to consider, you know, where we're going with this technology when we do make claims like, you know, this is revolutionary technology, right? And it is the insight that you're bringing to this conversation um, that I believe will lead us down that path in an effective way. So just thank you for that incredible talk and for joining us today. Thanks, Adam. Um, so thank you. Um, it'll be just a Canadian thank you off and we'll just yeah, never- we'll, Yeah, we'll <laughs> and then I'll we'll be sorry for saying thank you so much. And then we'll- <laughs> <laughs> So our next question is, when do you think that the current crisis to which you uh, referred to at the beginning, um, I'm, I'm kind of having issue reading this question, but when do you think the current crisis to which, yeah, um, why don't you try and read that question and let me know what you're thinking. Oh, that okay. So I think this is like talking about like kind of like capitalism and a disrupt at all costs, um, you know, uh, kind of hyper growth capitalism that we all live in. I don't know. I mean, I was going to actually talk about like I was going to add a historical framework for talking about these issues, um, maybe start after World War II, 1945. But then I kind of realized um, that's not really necessary. I think throughout many periods of history, there have been like sh like shift between political systems uh, changes and some, it hasn't always been positive, right? We haven't always been like victorious and like gone into times. Um, but I guess if the question is referring to the kind of specific time frame I kind of referenced in the beginning, I guess that would probably be like after World War II, you know, when USD became like the common global reserve currency and things like this. Um, Cool. Um, so in Canada or worldwide, 
do you think there are any policy changes that could be put in place to help transition to blockchain being more integrated in society? And then kind of maybe to add to that, um, like, you know, are there any policies and, and what is the likelihood of those policies being put into to action? And then kind of what do you think as a time frame to these things? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I think uh, from my experience um, and knowledge on the matter, you know, there it has to be some need and there has to be some justification for, you know, especially democracies, which kind of require the will of the people to get behind things like this. Um, and right now what I'm seeing uh, as a cause for that need is probably just all of the kind of uh, controversy um, around big tech and surveillance capitalism and like data, like privacy and also like uh, data ownership, all of these kind of problems are trickling into like the political realm. Um, you know, they've been around probably for a while, but only now are they becoming like um, existential threats um, to our kind of, yeah, common good. Um, so I think it'll just keep percolating and keep getting kind of, uh, you know, bad. And then eventually, um, you know, the government will have to probably lean on, you know, kind of builders. And this is part of the reason for my talk um, to help kind of usher in some new, let's say, uh, technical infrastructure or framework for, um, you know, doing the things that we do now, but like in more sustainable way, right? Not just like, you know, hyper growth. So um, I guess what I'm saying is like the so the seeds of destruction have already been sown. Um, it's just going to probably take some time for it to be like an even kind of more fatal um, thing. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so we just got another question. Okay, all of them coming in. So the first one we'll get to is do you see some focus or have some ideas on self-simplification in the blockchain space to prevent accumulating a lot of baggage as the previous financial and legal system. Sorry, was that self-sufficient? Uh, Simplification. Um, so, you know, in my notes and kind of in preparing for this talk, I, you know, was considering um, like what we as a community can do to start building like human institutions around this technology. You know, and we talk a lot about like blockchains as like nation states or like parachains as like nation states and like governments and like that's a great analogy. Um, so, you know, I do wonder like when will be time for us to kind of build some sort of organization or a way to make sure that the things that are being rolled out do have um, um, that. Yeah, I guess that they're not overly complicated within the human realm so that we can kind of deal with it. I feel like um, there's like other kind of tech technological like innovations, probably like within the realm of artificial intelligence. You know, they it just kind of we, we're seeing it's inequitable. We're seeing it's unjust. Um, and that's probably because these kind of concerns around um, human needs were never really considered at the beginning. So I guess I'm wondering, like, do we need a, some sort of like system around these technologies that are human, like, let's say like a United Nations type forum? Um, I'm not really sure, um, but I think eventually if we want to not repeat the mistakes of the past, we'll have to kind of figure out what that human system looks like. Absolutely, absolutely. And our final question here is how to build an inclusive system that's less exploitative of the weakest links. Oh, wow. That's an amazing question. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's uh, it could be a, a whole nother hour long discussion. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know how to. Maybe, maybe we should say, maybe we could kind of scope down this question. You know, how could blockchains potentially create more trustless relationships that in turn build a more inclusive system yeah. that's less exploitative to the weakest links. And with that, what are the biggest obstacles that we face with any technology, but blockchain specifically, that inherently does have some form of asymmetrical kind of knowledge barrier that does keep, you know, a certain actor at an advantage by just being aware of kind of the latest in the technology. Yeah, I mean, um, I, it could be like a technical answer, like how do we kind of prevent um, 
yeah, like bad behavior and like exploiting um, vulnerable people, or it could be like a human kind of organizational like answer. Um, I think like the main thing probably is like making sure that we're not just leaning on like trustless, like automated kind of relationships as like the end goal. Like that should potentially be a feature, but I think the end goal should always concern like the thing that you, like, what are you serving? Like, what needs does it address? Like, if it's financial inclusion, like, are the rates, like, just as bad? Does it, like, make people indebted just as more? Like, all of these kind of basic end user, I even hate the term user, because it referred, like, it's just a bad, but like the end human need, like, what is that thing? So I guess it'll have to be like a combination of like a technical solution with like a human approach to how we just treat one another. Um, for sure. For yeah. sure. At the end of the day, you know, technology doesn't change the way we interact with one another. The way we use technology will change the way that we interact with one another. And that's not to be underappreciated in terms of the significance of that human aspect. Exactly. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Elena, for joining us today. That was an incredible mm -hmm. talk and clearly created quite an incredible dialogue with the people listening so we really appreciate that and we're really excited to hear what you have to say next year at CSCon 1. Awesome I'm looking forward to it and congrats again to the whole team this has been a thank super you. cool event. Thank you so much for being here and yeah really excited to to talk soon have a great evening. Bye you too. Bye.